and kick off our recording and therefore kick off this event. We have some really fantastic speakers on the line today, and I want to make sure we're making the most of their time. Um, and so we're going to go ahead and get things started. But if people uh, jump in late, that is completely fine. Um, everyone is welcome. So I want to start things off with just a general thank you. Thanks for joining. Thanks for letting us use some of your time today. Um, we're really, really excited to talk more about this topic and to learn from um, our great nonprofit leaders um, on, this, on the subject. So as we get some logistic notes out of the way and some introductions flowing for uh, the Tappert staff members, as well as the nonprofit speakers on the line, I definitely welcome everyone who's an attendee for today. Please go ahead and introduce yourself using that chat box at the bottom of your screen. Let us know your name, where you're joining from, and if you feel comfortable sharing, um, we'd also love to hear why this cause is important to you. Why are you interested in voting rights? What are you hoping to learn more about it? So get those introductions going in the chat and feel free, share your LinkedIn profile. Networking connections, always, always encouraged um, here at Taproot. So use that space to get the chat going. <laughs> All right, so as you introduce yourself, um, I just want to say on behalf of the Tapper team, welcome again to today's event, Social Issue Spotlight, Voting Rights. Uh, we're excited to have you here for this lunch and learn, um, or it might be a breakfast and learn if you're joining from the West Coast. Uh, so welcome again. Um, as you might have heard um, from past Tapper events or emails, announcements, uh, our organization has really invested heavily in volunteerism research and user feedback and nonprofit feedback as well um, this year. And one of our overall learnings has been that folks in our community crave more knowledge about and exposure to the social issues that nonprofits are tackling. So greater access to information about the urgency of the challenge, the people that it impacts, and the really creative community-driven grassroots solutions that nonprofits are employing that will help us create additional cross-sector understanding, empathy, and pro bono connections, right? Um, and since we're not the experts, uh, Tappert is elevating the voices and work of our nonprofit partners um, through a series of social issue spotlight panels. Um, this is actually our second topic if you're here to talk about voting rights, to learn about voting rights, then you're definitely in the right place. Um, and we have um, a recording from our first panel um, that was on the topic of healthcare access available. And um, if you'd like the link to that, if you'd like to check it out, um, we have some staff members on the line who would be more than happy to provide you with that link. So today, Tappert is joined by a panel of a few of our nonprofit partners. Um, this is going to be a really open conversation on the challenges impacting voting rights, civic engagement, um, and how nonprofits are addressing disenfranchisement and other aspects of this pressing social issue. So we'll also discuss how these organizations can use your support you right now through pro bono consulting, through well, taproot, sure. um, or through things reason, like donation go or hands-on volunteers in the days, weeks, and months ahead. So really appreciate everyone who submitted questions upon registering for this event. We'll be using those, uh, those questions to kick off our panel um, and to get the conversation flowing, but don't be a stranger. Use the chat box, use the Q&A box to ask additional questions throughout. And we may invite you off of mute to ask that question or expand on that question if we have time at the end. Um, so again, a few logistical reminders. We are recording this panel and we will share out that recording with everyone who registered. Um, we are also gonna ask yourself to keep yourself muted while our speakers um, are answering questions or discussing things amongst themselves. Um, but again, if you have a really great question, we'll call you out and invite you to unmute yourself and talk directly to our speakers um, towards the second half of our event. And if you need any tech assistance throughout today's panel, um, please shoot a private chat to my Taproot colleague on the line, Megan Gillette. Megan, if you can give a little wave just to let folks know. Uh, so Megan would be more than happy to assist um, with any tech issue that you're experiencing. 
Okay, so with those logistics out of the way, I want to get things rolling. Um, my name is Kimberly Swartz. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I'm located in Charlotte, North Carolina, and I'm Taffert Foundation's Director of Community Engagement. I'll be your moderator throughout today's panel. Um, I'm also just an individual who is really passionate about civic engagement and the power that each citizen wields in making our countries kinder, stronger, and more supportive places to live. So I'm genuinely very excited to learn from each of the wonderful speakers that we have on the line today. So um, if anyone is new to Taproot and does have any questions about Taproot Foundation, again, this panel is not about Taproot, it's about some of our nonprofit partners. So we're not gonna spend too much time talking about our nonprofit, but if you have any questions, uh, I have so many Taproot colleagues on the line who'd be more than welcome um, or more than happy to answer them in the chat. So rather than me take more time to speak about Taproot, um, direct those questions in the chat and we'll definitely get answers to you either during this event or offline. Um, so now I'm delighted to introduce our speakers, our real leaders for today's conversation. And I'm gonna kick things off by introducing the League of Women Voters of Alameda. They're a nonprofit who celebrated their 100 year anniversary in 2020 which I mean, can we get like a virtual round of applause? That is just incredible, incredible milestone. They're an educational and political organization made up of women and men uh, who work to empower voters and defend democracy. Um, and today we're joined by two of their leaders, um, one of which Sheila Durkin is going to be hopping in um, in just a few minutes. Um, she was running late from a previous engagement, but she's a marketer and um, marketing research professional who began a second career in the nonprofit space after volunteering and retirement for a few different causes. Uh, her focus at LWC is civic engagement projects directed towards young and first-time voters. We're also uh, so happy to be joined uh, by Linda, or excuse me, Linda Bidoff, who is the chair of the Youth Outreach Services Committee for the League of Women Voters. Um, and she's a retired administrative law judge who has a passion for civics education and voting rights, which led her to volunteer with um, the LWC. Um, where she lives. Um, and she's also has deeply entrenched roots in the nonprofit community. And I'm sure if you, you ask, she would love to tell you more about each of the different causes that she's involved with. So welcome, welcome, welcome to the LWC. Thank you so much for being here. Our next nonprofit that we'll be hearing from is Inform Your Community. They're a nonprofit who focus on educating through fun, free, and meaningful events. They're creating an informed electorate through really intentional mission-driven work that's related to the four C's, civics, civic engagement, civility, and civil rights. Um, and so really pleased to um, be joined by Dr. Stacy Carrillo, who is a former college professor and an expert in stereotypes and the role they play in our society. She's also the founder and leader of Inform Your Community. So we're very lucky um, to be joined by her today. And then our final uh, nonprofit speaker for today's event is the Coalition for Racial Equity and Social Justice, who is a nonprofit organization, but they're also a safe place for people to engage in authentic conversations about racial and social inequality. They provide education and training and use that as a catalyst for large scale social change. And uh, we're lucky enough to be joined by several members of their team today. Um, the first of which I'll name is Roberta Brooks, who is a program coordinator at their nonprofit and also a steering committee member. As a practicing speech language pathologist, or excuse me, I completely butchered that, <laughs> that word, um, but I hope you'll excuse me. Um, she's spent many, many years working in stroke and traumatic brain injury discipline, um, and she worked to promote greater access to services for all Americans with lifelong health care needs, regardless of their backgrounds or ethnicities. And that's part of, um, which, um, part of what led her to the work that the coalition is doing. Our next speaker from the coalition is Dr. Bernadine um, Ahonke, who is a longtime community advocate and activist for justice and equality. 
and she founded uh, the Coalition for Racial Equity and Social Justice in 2020 in response to the horrific murder of George Floyd. Um, and so I'm sure will be a wealth of um, wisdom, knowledge, um, and also active activation for each of us on the line today. So really looking forward to hearing more about that founding story, Dr. Bernadine. And then our final representative uh, from the coalition is Dr. Patricia Franklin, who is a program coordinator and steering committee member um, at the coalition. Uh, she has a many decade long uh, background in clinical care and removing healthcare barriers to entry. Um, they are also heavily involved in mentorship programs and various nonprofit causes. And again, I'll mention, um, I'm sure if you ask a question about what else they're involved in, they'd be more than happy to tell you about those additional um, passion projects of theirs. So um, I just really want to say thank you so much to each of you for being with us today. Um, I already see some questions going on in the chat. Um, some sharing of website links. Um, we will definitely make sure to share out all, uh, all the different ways you can connect with each of these uh, wonderful women and the nonprofits that they lead or serve um, following today's event. So please stay tuned for that. All right, so without further ado, um, now that we've gotten through um, those uh, wonderful introductions to each of these folks, um, I want to pose our first Question. And this is open to all of our panel members. We're curious to learn more about why do you do what you do? Why were you called to working in this space? And I think, uh, Stacy, I would love if we could begin with you and, and your organization as the founder of Inform Your Community. Thank you so much, and, and thank you so much for having me on this panel, along with so, uh, such amazing uh, other presenters who are, who are here today. Really just wonderful to meet all of you. Uh, and so why did, I, why did I get into this space? Uh, so uh, I've been arguing with people on Facebook for about 10 years. That was kind of like my part-time job was arguing with people on Facebook. And because I have this strong communication background, it's what my PhD is in, it's also what I teach. Uh, particularly like conflict management and public speaking and, and interpersonal communication and business communication. I, I always would fight those fights to the end. So I, I wouldn't, you know, I'd be one of those people who wouldn't let that bone go until I could figure out what was at the heart of those conversations and, and those disagreements. And, and ultimately what I found over those years and years of, of having those arguments is that a lot of those arguments were really misunderstandings about things that were very, very basic. And it just took us a long time to like get into it enough to realize like, oh, I didn't realize that's what that meant. Or I didn't realize this issue affected that many people, you know, or, you know, and so all of these kind of basic ideas were at the heart of this misunderstanding. And, you know, I look around and I see all these amazing nonprofits that do such great good work uh, on single issues at really high levels. And, and I thought, you know what, even I, I'm, you know, with my PhD and my books and starting the nonprofit and all this, I'm still really intimidated by going to some non some events about issues that I don't really know about. Frankly, I'm, I'm often intimidated, you know, yeah. to go to some event where I'm, I'm not the expert. I really don't know that much about the topic. And there's folks there leading these, pre these presentations or on these panels or at these events who just know so much. And I'm not just talking about the presenters, but the attendees too, who already know so much about a topic. It's scary to even go, let alone say anything, let alone show my ignorance about a topic. And so um, I, I started thinking what the nonprofits that are doing good work in the world aren't doing is, is educating folks at the very entry level. Like what is some basic information that people need to know about issues that are really important to civic engagement, to getting people to the, the polls to vote, to getting people to engage in educated discussions before they start fights, before they start hating their relatives and not talking to friends anymore. Um, and so that's where I came to this space from. Um, my eclectic background, I, I had a crafting business for many years. Um, you know, I, I was a teacher 
I have such a strange background. And so having a nonprofit that was focused not just on one issue, like most nonprofits, but on many, sure. many, many issues, uh, really unlimited issues, um, but only at that intro level, I call it the 101 level, and um, uh, that do it in fun ways. Because I learned as a college professor, you're, you're not going to get anybody to try to engage with the information if you don't try to you know, especially the more complicated, exactly, the more complicated the information is, the more fun you have to make it. Um, and so really um, uh, making our events, we have six programs, children's crafting, adults crafting, movie nights, networking event um, where we do games, online games. We have a shopping event with handmade um, items for that our volunteers make. And, and then of course, more traditional things like a speaker series, but we try to make them fun. So really emphasizing fun, we say 51% fun, 49% information. And that's wow. that's how I got into the space. I love that. And um, I'm wondering why no one gave that same advice to some of the professors I had in college. Think about how much easier business statistics would have been. <laughs> um, but, and I think it relates so much to what we're trying to accomplish in this discussion room today, right? How are we trying to break down this really, really complicated issue of um, disenfranchisement and, and people using, wielding their right to vote at the polls um, and people, groups of folks who have historically been blocked or limited from wielding that power. Um, how are we breaking that really complicated topic down into something that's easy to understand and feels okay to talk about? Um, so I really, really appreciate you breaking it down in, in such a, a great way. And Stacey, we're definitely going to want to share some of those links to your speaker series and those crafting nights after this. So please send those links in and we'll share them out with everybody on the line. So Linda, I wonder if I could turn that same question to you, what led you to this space? What drives the work that you and the League of Women Voters are doing on a day-to-day -day basis? Sure, thanks. And thanks for uh, inviting us to be a part of this important panel. Um, and it's so exciting to meet other organizations that are doing things that are similar to us that I hope we can have a great relationship with in the future. Um, it's sort of interesting because I had sort of some, you know, thoughts planned, but after listening to Stacy's uh, comments, I want to sort of like, I think I want to just start by um, joining in with that because it's really sort of a similar uh, thing that started with me. I mean, I got involved in volunteering and politics when I was 16 in Wisconsin, um, you know, in, uh, you know, the days of um, uh, Jean McCarthy and the anti-war movement and have been involved ever since in one way or another. Um, I ended up going to law school because I very foolishly believed that if I became a lawyer, I could change the world. Um, took a while for me to learn that that wasn't going to happen. Uh, so I had to keep working in other ways to do that. Um, spent a, a lot of time while practicing law and then going on the bench as a judge, um, understanding how important the rule of law is, but also understanding that you need to meet people where they are. And so I've designed a lot of different curricula and I've also done a lot of adult education. I've taught in colleges, universities, and I've taught, taught judges um, on a number of different items. But it just, you know, what, and I continue to do all the political work. So when I retired, I decided that, you know, what was so important in this country, which was just going in a direction that I didn't understand as a political science major in college and a judge who was committed to the rule of law, I'm like, what is happening? And I started doing some research and realizing that, you know, when we started putting all of our emphasis on STEM education, we stopped teaching civics. So we have this whole group of young people that have no idea what the political history is of our country and the struggles that people have um, uh, engaged in for so long um, that, in, that they don't understand that we're about to lose it all. So, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about it. It's like, I don't know, I have a 25 year old daughter and I'm like, why does she have fewer rights than I did? You know, I was out on the streets, you know, um, fighting for abortion when I was 18. I mean, and I'm 70. I mean, it's like, what is this? What is this world coming to? So I decided that I really wanted that my focus where I could 
um, contribute the most would be to work, try to find a way to work with youth in a long-term capacity by helping them understand civics. And in order to, you have to understand civics, you have to understand our, our, our um, political history in order to be an effective participant in our democracy. And they have all of these barriers to doing that. Um, you know, if you've read some of the studies, they have our, our youth, um, uh, people under 30 have the lowest voting percentage um, in the country. Um, they've found that the reason, uh, uh, studies have found that one of the reasons they don't vote is they don't really have the information and they have all this disinformation. So, um, you know, some of the things that just really sort of, you know, blew my mind is questions like, uh, uh, how do I register to vote? And I'm like, you're on your phone every day. How can you not figure out the information is there? So, okay, so here's a barrier. We have to figure out how we can get to them uh, and show them uh, how to register to vote. Well, okay, but you know, if I, I don't understand everything that's happening on all these ballot measures and the candidates and what do I do about that? If I don't vote on everything, then my vote's not gonna count. Wrong, you know, you know, where are you getting this information from? So it's really basic, going back to what Stacy said, it's really basic information. And it's our job in the absence of good civics education to get that out. So that's my passion. So when I did that, I, you know, I hooked up with a woman who had really wonderful skills in terms of producing videos and educational materials. And um, we put together this. It, it, it's, it's sort of amazing. So we joined the League of Women Voters because they're really, uh, they're nonpartisan, they're well-respected. As you said, um, Kim, they've been around for 100 years and um, do really good work. And nobody knows about the great work they, they've done. And it's like, people think it's just a bunch of old ladies that are not uh, uh, associated or relevant in today's world. And that's part of what we want to um, uh, let people know is not really true. So anyhow, what we did is we decided that we had to meet people where they were the same way Stacy's group does. And so we created a game and I'll put the, the, uh, put the, uh, put it in the chat, the URL, but it's really easy. It's called verify.buzz. Go check it out. Um, we recruited a, um, a software engineer to help us do it. And um, we now have over 60 games, uh, wow. individual games on voting, news literacy, and civics. And um, we have uh, voting information for uh, 13 states right now. Uh, a 14th state will go live next week. We're working on the 15th state. We're trying to get it all together. But um, also, we realize that you know kids don't. Um, how do you figure out? Uh, whether what you're reading is true or not. And, and kids are like, they live on their phones and they just keep sending out things that they read. And so disinformation yeah. is going all over the place. So we wanted to, so we created it in, in, in a game format. And I'll talk more about the game later, but that's yeah. sort of where the passion is, is that work with a good organization that has a good reputation and try to get to the kids where they are because they're the future of our country. Thank you so much for that. And um, I was actually chatting with Megan earlier this morning about how cool those quizzes and games were. So definitely would love to hear more on that topic. And please, everyone check out that link in the chat and we'll, we'll share it after the fact too. But I'm already just from our two first speakers, there's a real through line forming here of basic education and making that basic education as accessible and as engaging as possible. Um, so I'm going to turn it to our final nonprofit um, speaker, Coalition for Justice. And uh, Dr. Bernadine, I would love to start with you as the founder of the organization, and then maybe we can go and um, pop in and hear from Pat and Roberta as well. Um, but same question directed towards you. Why do you do what you do? What led you to the formation of this nonprofit? Oh, and you might be muted. So I'm gonna go ahead and try to unmute you, Bernadine. Let me see. Okay, great. Great. Thank you, Kimberly. And that's such a great question. And thanks for you know getting all of us together. 
it seems as if we have a common thread here about what you know we all do in this space of advocacy and activism. Um, for me, I um, found you know my husband and I came to the U.S. several several years ago to study, and we ended up staying. Uh, we're both a uh, background. Uh, we were born and raised in Nigeria and West Africa, where there's nothing like racism or discrimination. Uh, we may have uh, ethnic um, rivalries, but it's not what you know uh, we experience here in terms of uh, marginalization and um, a discrimination against people of color. And uh, you know we've struggled with that over the years with our children in school. We live in a suburban school, a suburban area where in fact, as when my children were growing up, um, they were the only black kids in school and we experienced all kinds of issues. Um, I have a background in education, leadership and policy um, from Columbia University in, in New York. And uh, we had to fight for our children to be placed in, uh, uh, in you, know, high, you know, high quality and high level education um, uh, opportunities for them, it wasn't given to them and because of uh, the, you know, racism in the country. But um, fast forward in 2020 when George Floyd was killed, uh, by then I had retired from uh, working in a department of education in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. I um, decided um, something needed to be done. And uh, what could that be? I have a background in education by training and experience. And frankly, I believe that one of the um, ways to address the issue of racial discrimination and racism in our country, in our society, is through education, creating awareness and understanding of the history of this country and the lived experiences of people of color, especially Black Americans. So I reached out to a few people that I know and decided to find, uh, to found the Coalition for Racial Equity and Social Justice uh, to create a space, a safe space to bring uh, people in our community together to engage in authentic and meaningful discussions about racial uh, discrimination and racism in our communities and in our country as a whole. Um, we're only two years in the making and uh, you know, I'm lucky to have um, committed people like Dr. Frank, Pat Franklin and Roberta Brooks, who are um, accompanying me on this journey, uh, and a host of other people, uh, we've made significant impact in, in our community, frankly, nationally. We do host uh, a national a guest speaker series on the second Monday of the month, where um, we were exposed nationally and frankly, uh, overseas also, um, by in 20, during the uh, Biden-Harris um, inauguration, um, when they were doing their inauguration, where somehow our coalition for justice was made known to them and were invited to join their national um, event for Martin Luther King Day that year in 2021. So we're having people log into our guest speaker series uh, on the second Monday of the month from all over the world, from Sydney, Australia, from Israel, Mexico, uh, you name it. Um, so wow. that's what we're about. And um, we're also currently working on launching diversity, equity, and justice uh, education in our school districts, which we have secured two funding for, from a local organized uh, foundation and also from our, our county, Montgomery County, uh, the uh, American Pandemic uh, Recovery Fund. So we'll be going into our school districts. Um, we've developed a program, an eight week lesson um, that we'll be going and working with uh, students in the school district during school hours um, on um, educating them. Because as Linda mentioned, unfortunately, our children are not being taught civics. They are not being taught the history, the true history of this country. and. Uh, you know, we need, we feel that we need to get those children at a younger age. Uh, our students, uh, youth um, diversity program is targets students in grades six through eight or nine, because if I feel that by the time they get to junior high and high school, the extremist swing have already grabbed them from us. So we need to start from young to try to teach them the true uh, history, to teach them who they, who they are, their identity, 
uh, diversity, justice, and, and also encourage them to use their voices and to take action so that by the time they get to 18, they register to vote and make their yeah. voices heard about issues that affect them. Uh, you know, so that's what we're about. And uh, I'll stop there and let Pat and Roberta add, add to that. Thank you. Yeah, how about we turn things to, to Dr. Franklin first? Yes, hi everyone. Thank you so much for having this important forum today. It's, um, it's encouraging for sure um, to me. I, um, I'm a clinician, I'm a physician by training and I was in academic medicine for many years um, and health equity uh, problems, uh, you know, were uh, visible at, you know, in all, at all layers in our healthcare systems. Um, so I dealt with that on an ongoing basis, personally, individually with my patients, but also collectively in committees uh, to try to, to, to move the needle forward and make changes. Um, but I'm retired now and I was looking around for something to do. And lo and behold, I started to, uh, with, the, with the COVID, I started to watch Zoom programs as we all did. And um, I came across a, a little organization, a grassroots organization called Coalition for Justice. And uh, I was just, you know, entranced by what they were doing and the work, the quality work that the, and the presenters and the information that was coming out. And so um, I just kept coming back. And so lo and behold, here I am. Um, but I was thinking, I think the thread definitely is education. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of uh, misinformation, a lot of ignorance out there at all levels and all, you know, whether we're, we're well-educated or, or, or not. Um, there's a lot of, of misinformation and, and it seems like that's really the, um, you know, the status quo these days. So our, our job is, is in part to get the truth out there, to inform sure. people and let them make their own decisions. Um, and I think that the, the two things that would come to mind though is empowering people uh, and making it relevant. I remember when I was a child and growing up in Brooklyn, New York, um, the first political action I ever remember ever taking was when I was about, uh, 11 years old, they had opened a, um, a large medical center in our neighborhood. They built it from the ground up, brand new, uh, in Williamsburg, Brooklyn. And it's still there today, Woodhull. Um, but the mayor at the time, Mayor Koch, uh, made a statement on, on camera saying that it, there was a delay in the opening. It, it, a year, it was like a year's delay, and then it just kept dragging on. And, and finally, he made a comment on camera one day and he said, well, I think this, this health center is too good for the neighborhood. Well, that got my attention. Yeah. At the time, I, I wasn't interested in healthcare at all. I was a science uh, nerd, but I wasn't interested in healthcare, but I remembered that and, I, and I, I turned to my parents and I'm like, what, what did he just say? And uh, I got my pen and paper and I scratched out something and I, then I typed it on my old typewriter and did my whiteout and corrected it. And I sent him a letter and I told him that if he didn't change his attitude and open that health center, we were gonna be protesting in the street. <laughs> and my mother and father did that. Uh, and sure enough, within a matter of months that health center was opened. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was civic action, but I'd had to be relevant to be empowered. And I think that, that that was those are the key components. We have to be educated about what we're talking about mm -hmm. and edu and provide that information, but we have to make it relevant to those that we're trying to reach mm -hmm. and to, to empower them to action. Mm -hmm. So that's that was that's a, this is a beautiful forum today. I'm very happy to be a part of it. Oh, we're so happy to have you a part of it. And um, actually wrote down a question um, that I want to loop back to in a, in a little bit because we did have a someone from our audience submit a question before this around how they can get their teenagers get their children involved in this mm -hmm. and um that that point you just posed about i remember when i made my first political action i think i would love for all of us to just reflect on that for a moment and think about what was our political first political action what was our first foray into into using our power as citizens and um how could we use that to just as you just mentioned pat make things feel relevant and engaging and accessible to young people and use that as a way um, to get them to start owning their own power so let's sit on that for a bit and, and return to it in a little while because roberta i'm so excited to hear from you and and what led you to this space well, th thank you again for putting together this amazing panel. It's a wonderful experience. And um, I'm 
actually also have worked in healthcare for all of my life. And um, even though communication is my issue, I and I am passionate about language, um, I'm actually not a person who's um, comfortable speaking publicly. And mm -hmm. also very, um, by nature, sort of like live and let live. You know, I'm, I'm non-judgmental. I, I, and so for, for as long as I can remember, you know, I just sort of kept hoping and thinking that, you know, the right, right, again, I'm non-judgmental, I'm saying right, but that common sense will prevail and that um, people will learn to live and let live. And, um, and then the, the, um, the message that kept getting louder and louder is, um, you know, if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem that, that, you know, it finally sunk in. Um, and, you know, I'm a person that had civics in, in school and, and actually still remember the, the jingles, the, the schoolhouse rock video, which is a wonderful video about how a bill becomes law that that stayed with me. But um, again, when I sort of retired from full time work, I thought, you know, I need to find a, a place where I can really sort of get comfortable speaking out. And um, I'm, I think that I have a particular strength in trying to deliver messages as, as even keeled as possibly, which makes me a very long winded speaker a lot of the time. But um, having an opportunity to um, sort of like really practice and develop those skills about saying what's important and why it's important and realizing that um, there, you know, even though I certainly, um, I, I grew up in, a, in, in the Midwest in, in the St. Louis, which was actually, a, the, the community was fairly diverse. Um, so there was not, you know, a full opportunity to see exactly how things really are. And, and then I moved to Boston and you could really see how things are. And um, so I was actually attending a, a, a wonderful series of lectures at a local community college about, you know, what, you know, how to educate yourself and how to get the message out. And one of the other people in the, in the group happened to mention the Coalition for Justice and how much she was how, how much she was learning and what a welcoming group it was. And so I, that's how I got involved. And um, it really is that idea of, I, you know, for me that what's, what's so special about the coalition is you know, we're, we're certainly tackling discussions that are, that are hard discussions, but it's done in a, you know, in a very caring and, and um, respectful environment. And again, just really thrilled to be here today. Thank you so much. No, oh, that's great to hear. Thank you so much. Um, I want to go back to this question um, that one of our registrants posed around, I know that this is important and I want my children to know that it's important and I want them to get involved. But also we all know you can't, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't force them to drink, right? So how are some ways, I wonder if we can just do like a rapid fire, perhaps go around and share like one tip, one way that a, a child or maybe someone who's more of a young adult, if we're, we're thinking about a high school, um, high school student, um, what's one way that we can get them thinking about this, get them educated on this, or get them involved in taking action here? Um, and Sheila, I see that you hopped on the line um, and I'd love to pull you into the discussion. Do you have a tip for anyone who has a child, a teen that they're looking to, to engage in this work? Oh, hi, thanks Kimberly and thanks to everyone. I've been really inspired by listening to some of the last speakers since I came on. Um, the one thing that I always keep thinking about in terms of um, getting other people involved is the term outreach. And I learned a long time ago that outreach doesn't mean that you reach out to them. It means that you go to them and find out what it is that motivates them mm. and that you try to then address what is important to them. So we have found in, in uh, working with high school students, for example, that there are some specific areas that they're very passionate about. Uh, one of them, of course, being climate change, one of them being gun control, one of them being reproductive rights, some others being 
uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. They are a really passionate group of people. You just need to know and find what their passion is, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And I think there's a through line there from one of our um, previous speakers as well, when they were talking about relevance, that relevance is going to be the key for, for mm -hmm. getting people um, involved. Uh, Dr. Stacy, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Maybe one, one way um, a teen or a child could get involved or a tip for a parent on, on how to make them motivated to get involved. I recently attended a, a panel uh, at, it was at Cooper Union um, and Maya Wally was one of the, the speakers, former mayoral candidate. And um, it, well, I, I forget the other speaker, but there was a writer from the, the Daily Show who was there. Um, in any case, it was a great event. And one of the things that was said at the event was um, there should be no party without, uh, uh, without an action item. And I thought that was so brilliant uh, really, it was so brilliant, and um, it was—I believe it was the writer from the former head writer from the Daily Show who had said that. Mm -hmm. And um, that's so. Our children's events are really for all all ages, uh, and we incorporate with the craft, whatever the craft is. We're talking about some major issues. So we just had um, an, a, a crafting event for kids about Indigenous Peoples Day. We have one uh, that's coming up for uh, Day of the Dead that we're going to be talking about Mexican culture. And, and so, you know, whatever we're doing, we can have some activity where we talk about why we're doing this activity, you know, yeah. something of relevance. So that's, that's my tip. And we, and we, we stay true to that as an organization as well. Perfect. Dr. Franklin, I, I know you and I were chatting a little bit about this topic before the event kicked off. So I would really love to hear your thoughts or advice on it. You're putting me on the spot now. So I am putting you on the I, spot. Um, well, I I just think back to my experience, and, and it, I agree it, it has to it has to be meaningful, um, but it it can be fun too. Um, but I think that anything that pulls at your heartstrings uh, and gets gets you motivated and activated. Um, you know, I'm not a I'm I'm an internist, so I do adult medicine. So I'm not, a, I'm not really great. I think Bernadine would be the better person to ask about this <laughs> age group. Um, but I think that they're adults. I mean, I think you have to meet them where they are. That's true. And um, just talk to them, you know, uh, respectfully. I think you know you have a conversation sometimes with younger people, and we kind of are condescending, or we assume that they don't know something, or they're just in their heads all the time, or on their phones. Um, they have a lot of uh, to say, and they mm -hmm. have um, they're, mm -hmm. they're you know they they want to engage with older mm -hmm. people, but mm -hmm. they don't know how. So we have to sometimes be the one to reach out and have that conversation, mm -hmm. uh, and not sort of be negative about the social media part. I think we we tend to sort of bash that too much, and then they pull away. They feel as though we're we're you know that we're alienating them, which we are. So I think we need to also be up on some of this stuff too. I don't, I don't know about, I've heard of TikTok. I don't, I've never engaged with it, but you know, know a little bit about the lingo, know about what's, what the young people are involved with mm -hmm. so that you can at least have a conversation where you can speak the same language mm -hmm. and, uh, and then go from there. But they want to learn, they need to, you know, and I think that we need to set that foundation and but well, we, we sometimes have to extend ourselves, I think, would be the, the key part and just meet them where they are. Yeah, meet them where mm -hmm. they're at. I really, really yeah. love that. Yeah. And actually, we had some great ideas come in from Roberta. So Roberta, would love to invite you to come off of mute in case there's anything additional you wanted to say on that topic or any questions on the topic you wanted to pose to some of our presenters. And it's totally fine if you want to stay keep the conversation in the chat. Yeah. Hello? Great. Yes, hello. Okay. Uh, I've just, <laughs> I just hopped on for a few minutes just to uh, hear uh, what was going on on this topic. But voting has been a um, strong interest of mine and uh, because of there's so many, I mean, you know, we just need the information. I found out a lot of people in my, communities were not voting. And so uh, I kind of wondered, well, why aren't we voting? People would think that it didn't matter or one vote doesn't matter. And it does matter. One vote yeah. can make uh, the difference. One voice can make the difference. I've experienced it myself. And 
what I did as an adult was join some local things. Like um, I had some local activities in my neighborhood. Then I also um, joined like a, a commission, a city commission. And I'm not a person that likes to be out front talking a lot about a subject, but what happens is I'm one of those people that get an aha moment and a solution. People can be talking and a solution will pop in my head. And I found out those solutions, even if it was just one thing that I said, could change the whole meeting. It could change mm -hmm. the whole um, uh, thing because maybe people hadn't thought of it in that one way that, you know, like I said, the answer maybe have popped into my head. So I'm not a person that just, you know, gets on and talks a whole lot, <laughs> but I've enjoyed what I've heard so far. And, uh, but that's what I've done. And then also in um, the local UN, I'm not involved with the local UN now, but uh, a lot of people said, well, it doesn't matter at the UN, but I found out even there that worked. Uh, even to mm -hmm. the national and the local UN, I would go there to the meetings and uh, what would happen is the same thing. And I did, you know, a solution would pop into my head and uh, it changed the whole outcome of the meeting. You know? Yeah, can't be so, afraid to use your voice. One voice can, one voice can change uh, a thing. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. I really appreciate that, okay. Roberta. Thanks so much for hopping on. And, I, you know, okay. you bring up this really, really great point that we haven't touched on too much yet around how can we each individually not just use our vote, use our power, get our kids involved, get our family members involved, um, but are there other places? Could we go volunteer? Can we get our community members? What can we do on the streets, out in the community um, to assist this cause. And so I would love to, to go around to some of our featured nonprofits today and just talk about any opportunities you have available to work with or support your organization. And if there's anything that folks need to keep in mind when volunteering for a voting rights nonprofit. Um, Bernadine, I would love to start with you first if you're game. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I really like the last question and all the answers, you know, how, you know, to um, get the young ones involved, you know, what's like relevant, relatable, committed, meaningful, that's really great. Um, but in terms of working with other organizations, actually that's, well, we're doing that um, in Pennsylvania with the Coalition for Justice. We were working with, um, we have an organization I serve on the um, advisory commission, uh, the uh, Montgomery Box County um, Collaborative. And that's also the Pennsylvania Health Network, uh, Access Network, Pennsylvania Health Access Network, and also Power, Power of Foundation. We're working with these three organizations um, to get uh, people to register to vote, to educate people. Right. As we all know, um, people um, of color, especially black folks, are um, very distrustful of our government based on their you know, uh, decades of experiences with the government. Um, so like in Philadelphia, you know, um, it's difficult to get um, black folks out to vote because uh, they feel that um, their, voice, their voices or their votes really do not translate into um, uh, meaningful opportunities for them or changing um, uh, what's happening in their communities. But we're going out and educating them on Saturday, actually, in Philadelphia, not Saturday, next Tuesday, in Philadelphia, we'll, some of us are going with the Power of Foundation um, to, uh, for an event on registering, uh, getting people out to vote, educating people about the issues, and um, also um, letting them know uh, what kind of assistance they can have. Some people who don't drive or don't have cars and, and with all the um, gerrymandering that's going on around yeah. us, some polling stations are uh, closed down and uh, distance from to polling station are, uh, have increased for some people of, uh, of color. So there's the problem of transportation, how to get to the polling stations and what have you. So we do, you know, work with them on those logistics to get them out um, to get their voices heard and to, you know, to vote on issues that affect them. So that's some of the things we're doing. Uh, we're really active in, in doing that, you know, because this current election for us in Pennsylvania is a very important election. 
a democratic yeah. governor um, uh, is finishing his last term. And uh, we have some important seats in the Senate and the House that uh, we need to make sure that um, the right people are voted in, um, you know, uh, in November. Yeah, the midterms are approaching. That's, right. This is a really relevant time for this conversation and a really important time for each of us on the line. And for all those who are listening to this recording, think about, um, to, to Dr. Bernadine's point, um, how can you can you assist with the logistics of even getting people to the polls? There's a lot of a large portion of our population that's homebound. Mm -hmm. um, think about how you can help your neighbors get themselves to the polls. Think about how you can get uh, your college students signed up for an absentee ballot, right? So they can mail it in instead. Um, so just that focusing on logistics, really, really important point. So I appreciate that advice. Linda, I wonder, could I jump to you to hear your thoughts on um, what are some ways that folks can volunteer to support this cause or your organization specifically in the months ahead? I'm, I'm, thanks, Kim. Um, we have a lot of ideas and we need a lot of help because we are a really small organization with really big goals. Um, but I'm gonna defer to my colleague, Sheila Durkin, um, because she's all prepared to answer that question. Perfect, Sheila. Yeah, we um, we actually, as Linda said, you know, we're trying to scale up as far as our uh, outreach to uh, specifically um, young and um, future would be new uh, voters with our uh, online game. We've been, um, we've been successful in introducing it into our schools and have it accepted as a resource at the State Office of Education for California. But <clears throat> there's so many other areas where we would like to expand our reach and would really love to have um, some help in, in marketing the program uh, to, uh, to other cities, counties, states. Um, the other thing is we have, um, we have some technical support needs because we, we do have a, um, a retired, newly retired uh, software engineer that helped us to develop the program initially. And um, he basically wants to do some other things and not spend as much time working on the, on the program. So um, we're gonna put together some specifics in a project that, we'll, that we will be posting on Taproot's website. Uh, that will give more specifics about the kinds of, uh, of tech skills we need because I don't have them at the top of my head, but I can, I can put that together. So um, the other thing is just people who have an interest in education and uh, civics and maybe have some writing skills, uh, we would really love to have uh, some volunteer help with um, researching and writing some of the questions that we have, because it's a big job. There's about a thousand questions now in, sure. in the game. And uh, I think Linda probably already told you that we have, uh, I think we're approaching 15 states. So we have a ways to go yet. Uh, we've been working on this for a couple of years, but, but we would really, um, we'd love to talk to anybody who has an interest in civic engagement or uh, education. We can definitely find some, some uh, job that they, they would be able to, um, to help us with. And the last thing I just wanna mention as a League of Women Voters member is um, if, if there's something that you can, there, there is something that you can do to help your community. And one of the things is when you're talking to people, make sure that you ask them, are you registered at your current address? Because there's mm -hmm. so many things going on now with voter suppression and changes in voting laws that, um, that people really need to double check that they are registered so that they can vote. So there won't be any surprises at the, at the polling place. So I would just ask everybody if you, know, if you can just ask that question of all of the people that you know, um, just to double check that. Yeah, that is such powerful advice. And um, we'll, we'll make sure to underline that in our follow-up key takeaways. Are you registered to vote at your current address? Really, really helpful. And also um, just a note for folks on the line, folks that are listening in um, after the fact, we are gonna be sending out kind of a follow-up one pager with uh, links to different opportunities to get involved with these great nonprofits. Some of those are going to be the open Taproot Plus listings. So um, I know 
Sheila, you just mentioned you're finishing up a listing. Um, Roberta, you and I were talking about finishing up a listing just this morning. And so we'll keep working on that page and we'll try and we'll get it out by the end of the week so we can get those links in front of our volunteer community members. Now, right. Stacy, we have a few minutes left and I wanna make sure that we hear your thoughts on this really important question too. Thank you. I was just going to say that we currently have some opportunities posted Perfect. on Taproot. We're very excited about it. And it was great working with Megan and with Taproot to get those posted. So we're very excited about them. And just in general, a great way to get people involved in a kind of mutually beneficial way is a lot of our projects involve marketing related stuff, yeah. um, social media related stuff, graphic design related stuff. And, and all three of those are amazing skills that if students or young professionals want to enhance their own resumes, those or, or even um, yeah. you know, senior professionals or retired folks who, um, who want to enhance those skill sets, it's a great opportunity to kind of mutually learn and or use their or experience they already have on very kind of um, important ways that all nonprofits can can use marketing, graphic design, uh, social media outreach. So uh, check out our our post on Taproot already. Perfect. And we'll help direct people uh, to your posts, um, Stacy and and to our other nonprofits on the line as well. We're really looking forward to hopefully helping you make connections with our volunteers, whether there's pro bono connections or uh, there's more folks showing up to all the great speaker series um, that are coming up. Um, so I see some folks are having to jump for their next meeting. Um, so let's go ahead and we'll wind things down for this conversation. But I do really wanna highlight and underline we are going to try and share out um, contact details, LinkedIn profiles, websites, so that everyone can continue connections and continue the conversation after this. We recognize that 60 minutes is not nearly long enough to dig into voting rights as a whole. And so let's think of this as 101, maybe like even 100.5, maybe we're not even at the 101 level yet when it comes to, to voting rights and awareness and why this issue is so important. So we really hope this can be a catalyst um, for everyone who's listening in or who was able to join to go out and seek more resources, to go out and seek deeper connections with each of these wonderful nonprofits um, that were so generous with their time and passion today. So I wanna say a very sincere thank you to um, Stacy and uh, Roberta and Bernadine and Pat and Linda and Sheila, um, really appreciate you spending your time with us and um, appreciate all the work that you're doing day in and day out. Um, and, thank and thank you, everyone you. who tuned thank in. You. I was say, and thanks, thank Chapter, for all you. the wonderful thank help you. and all the support. We really appreciate it. Uh, it's, it's quite literally our pleasure. It's <laughs> why we do what we do. So, we really appreciate you, you all. Thank you. Thank all you. right. Have a great rest of your day, everyone. Bye now. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.